Welcome to Worlds Collide, a wrestling card podcast for wrestling fans by wrestling fans, featuring Tony Bella from WrestlingTradingCards.com. This is like a, a stock market. Like- and Zan Morning from Wrestling With Cards on YouTube. And I'm not saying there's a right or wrong answer, I'm just posing the question. Join them as they navigate the world of wrestling cards, helping you build a bigger and better collection and making some money along the way. Show. Dude, I'm ready to go tonight. I am so ready to go. <laughs> well, all right. If you're ready, let's go. What's up, everybody? Worlds collide. And <laughs> off air, we are off to quite the train wreck of a show so far. <laughs> so we're lucky we made it this far for you guys, but everybody seems to love these. We've got two people on. One of them Tony's very familiar with. One of them I'm familiar with. We've tried to book three times. So we've got a person we tried to book three times, first time guest. But let's start with Tony. Tony, how are you doing? You know, I'm doing great, man. I'm just uh, living the life here in this wonderful, chilly, chilly, chilly Phoenix weather. It's 76 out right now. Oh, <laughs> I'm so, so, so cold. I'm glad you got the enthusiasm. Though. It's kicking the show off with how you're ready to go. And hopefully that's <laughs> going to carry, carry over to our guests. So, uh, Daryl, Daryl, we're going to let you start off first. Just introduce yourself and uh, anything else you got to say. <laughs> um, my name is Daryl. I own and operate... 3D sports cards in Phoenix, Arizona. I run special signing events. Tony's been the one getting me the wrestlers. That's been my thing. I sponsor three different wrestling organizations here in the Phoenix area. And I love, I live for wrestling. Wrestling and UFC are my two big things. And we've got Drake. Drake's PC, Drake Magruder. Tried to book you three times. We finally got you on. And you're in the middle. Well, not really the middle. It's kicking off. At the Dallas Card Show. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So thanks for having me on. I'm glad it uh, finally worked out. I'm uh, grew up in the Memphis area, and uh, you know, as they say, you can take the boy out of Memphis, but you can't take the Memphis out of the boy. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a huge Memphis wrestling guy. I grew up around it, and uh, just just never really grew out of it, I guess you'd say. And now, now living in Northwest Arkansas, and uh, just so happened a, a work trip coincided with the Dallas Card Show, so. Um, Looking forward to checking that out and hopefully seeing some cool wrestling cards. I have this really suspicious feeling that at this Dallas card show, after what we've seen the last couple of months with wrestling cards and the modern shiny stuff specifically, I think you're going to see some wrestling cards there. What do you think? Absolutely. You looking for a particular pickup? You know, I'm just looking uh, for anything rock. So I'm like, uh, the, the, out of the 2020, yes, it's shocking, right? Um, out of the 2020 uh, Chrome set, I'm missing his red refractor. I know there's only Ooh. five. Um, I know two people that have one, and I don't think they're giving them up anytime soon. So I'm wondering if the three are out there and, uh, you know, that whole sort of thing. So that, well, that, let, Let's find their address. I can make sure they can loosen one of those up for you. <laughs> uh, I like it. I like it. I like the positivity. Um, I'll make it know, happen. You know, speaking of that, Drake, I'm just going to – just and to be transparent with everybody, we're giving Drake two questions tonight since he has been rebooked three times now. So, but when Mir and Drake were talking offline, I was like, these are such good questions. Like I could probably give you five. And since we just talked about the the rock refractor and we're talking about Dallas card show, I figure I'll just let you start off with your first question since it kind of ties in with that. Yeah. So thanks for asking me that. Yeah. So my first question is, is, um, you know, you, we've seen in the modern wrestling card market as things have kind of taken a run. Um, there's a lot of, a uh, lot of folks that, you know, that were maybe invested in the card for a small amount of money and they're okay with selling things now that there's been a run up and maybe they want to reinvest into something else, some other wrestling card or something like that. They're not afraid to bring those to market. Um, they don't really ha- appear to have that, that hoarding mentality, I guess we'll say. But then when you kind of go to the vintage market and we're talking about like folks that got the 1982 wrestling all-stars and some of the 90s stuff and and maybe even like early 2000s, kind of thinking of that 2002 Fleer Royal Rumble set and things like that. um, It just seems like a lot of those guys, even though they got into it very early, they're just not that those cards aren't really liquid for them. Um, And for me, who's kind of someone who's wanting to get into you know, to have a mix of modern and vintage and things like that. There's just some of those cards that are, don't really come up for sale uh, very often. And, you know, when they do, of course, they're fetching high prices, but then you see a lot of uh, folks that have these phenomenal collections, you know, like a David Peck or a Rob England or a Jamie Wallace or, you know, those kind of guys. Um, And they've got multiples of a card that you want. 
And it just kind of, it begs the question to me, like, like, like what, what, what's their end game with that as far as holding multiples of a copy? Cause me as a collector, it's hard for me to hold more than one, one copy of a card. If, if a, a modern card comes up and I'm like, Ooh, well, I could go buy that. Um, that's not why I buy cards. I don't buy them for a financial aspect. For me, if a card comes up, even if I, if I have it, and even if I want it and think, Hey, that's a great buy from a truly financial perspective, I'd rather somebody else buy it because that could be a new entrant into the wrestling card market, which overall helps to grow the market. And I think by people that just get it and I'm, and I'm not, I'm not shaming or talking bad about them. So please don't let me, please don't let it come across like that. But I just feel like that inhibits the growth of that, that area of the market, which, you know, in turn, we all as wrestling card collectors, we want that market segment to grow. So, um, so I guess that kind of lends my question is like, why do you feel like that those folks are just want to hold all those cards and like, what is their end game with that uh, compared to what we're seeing with the more modern kind of shiny wrestling collectors who are not afraid to move stuff kind of in and out? I guess I can, <laughs> I can start, but I just, I, I just have so many different directions we can go. Um, go for I, it, man. I constantly like want to compare this to pre-war baseball because there's that segment of those baseball collectors that they do their thing. They don't get too far outside of it. They know everything there is to know about that little segment. And if you notice, like that segment of the hobby doesn't grow like more of the modern stuff does talking sports cards. Um, you know, so here I'm using the baseball analogy, but you could kind of put that into whatever you wanted. Cause I mean, the vintage basketball collectors seem to don't expand like some of the modern, like, you know, most of the time I see, uh, videos at, sh at shows or at trade nights or something like that. The younger kids are getting into the shiny stuff, the more modern stuff, because that's what they're growing up with. That's what they understand. And it doesn't seem like that segment that's into vintage is really trying to reach out to the younger crowd and say, this is, you know, well, if you want to talk about the all-stars, it's a prime example, because I think it's a super polarizing set, you know, talking about Hogan or Jerry Blackwell or, you know, um, who else? Kerry Von Erich, I mean, that, that, like, that's a Hulk Hogan-esque talent in the 80s that, you know, maybe a 10-year-old kid doesn't really know about that does have access to go watch that now on Peacock for hours. And I, I, I just don't know. I think it's, um, I wonder if they're just kind of stuck in their ways and that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just, this is, this is their lane and this is what they're staying in. And it could also be, and I'm, I'm not really accusing anybody of this, but it's something that just kind of popped into my mind. I'm wondering if, because they didn't get on in on the modern shiny stuff at $5 a card that they're kind of pushing it to the side and saying, well, with this, you know, we don't, it's not that they necessarily don't like it. It's just that they're not putting that at the same pedestal as theirs because they've, they've got to keep pumping their own stuff to hold that value because they didn't get the shiny stuff. Or we, me, me and Tony talked about this on a recent episode with AEW. I think a lot of the people that hated on AEW, um, you know, the ones that were very, very angry about it were the ones that just like, Maybe they couldn't get the hobby boxes earlier. Maybe they're just so pro WWE. So I think there's an underlying factor, but what that is, I don't know. Um, Drake, uh, we've talked a little bit offline that because I'm a diehard All Stars fan, it's my favorite card set ever, and I don't care if the you know best collectors in the world have it or if nobody has it. Like that is my set, and I'm trying to. I've got the whole thing, of course, I've talked about it a million times, but I'm trying to get it autographed and slabbed. So. I would like to have as many, and I'm work. I've made like tremendous amount of work on that in the last two months, and just recently, there's a couple of guys that are big. You know, um, we had one of them on here, Uncle Danny, talking about <laughs> is he the new wrestling card king? He hooked me up with three today, like, and he gave me a heck of a deal on it. And Greg Knapp, um, main event collectibles on Twitter, also hooked me up with a PSA eight Harley Race auto in a very easy trade. And the cool thing about it is I was able to trade him some shiny stuff for some vintage stuff. And I'm like, and, and it was super easy deal. Great to work with. So there's guys out there that, you know, will work with you on things, but I'm with you, Drake. I, I just, I don't understand why um, some that like, I like to stack cards. You said you don't necessarily to buy it for the monetary gain. I do, but as soon as I get it, I'm ready to let it go. I just need one copy. And then I want other people to experience those that way the collectors have the cards. I can get the money to then go buy another card or something else. And everybody wins. Um, I don't know. Tony, what do you think? Me? Uh, 
Uh, we covered a lot of ground there, so take it. We, co- we covered a, a, a ton of right there, like, but uh, you know, I'm I'm not a collector of anything really. So, like, other than like I said before uh, earlier off air, that I'm more about information stuff now. So my my mindset has changed over the years from when I used to be a, a master set collector when I was a really diehard collector. Uh, so nothing, nothing. I'm not married to anything. I mean, I, really. I mean, even if even though I'm a Kurt Angle PC, you know, collector someone offered me something nice i'd probably sell it too i mean i'm not married to anything other than for me now it's just gathering information to make wtc as best as it can be but i kind of agree with you people get stuck in their own lane and that's okay that's so that's a good way to collect you know if you're going to flex what you flex and you know what you know that's what you're going to do and i I know there's certain guys who have cutoff times from like i don't know anything really beyond 2002 so why would I want to get involved? It's like, I don't follow the current product. I'm not a fan of modern wrestling. I don't know about AEW. I never heard about Ring of Honor. I don't, I mean, these guys who don't know stuff like that, uh, just they're not interested in it. So I, I can understand why they're not getting into shiny stuff. But, you know, me, like Drake said, I if I had like my time, if I had one copy, I'm good with it. Like I would pass up another copy so somebody else could get it because I don't need it. I already had it. I had it. I scanned it. It's ready to go on the checklist page. It's good to go. I don't need it. I mean, I, I, I had multiples of, you know, all the all-stars you talk about, I've had multiples of these and uh, you know, I, I don't need them. <laughs> my, my collection lives and breathes on WTC now with images being added to their daily now. Oops, cat out of the bag. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I just, uh, I, I don't really need it anymore. So I, I get when we have the hardcore guys out there, you, Drake, you mentioned them like, you know, uh, Jamie and Peck and, and England, they seem to get involved in every conversation we have about when it comes to vintage stuff, of course. Uh, and there's guys now who are making clamoring for all that shiny stuff. Like you said, they're looking for that 2014, 2015, you know, all that uh, Chrome stuff. You know, me, I'm sitting on a ton of 2006, 2007 Chrome, so I'm waiting for the trickle effect. So I, I want that to happen so I can start moving that stuff too yep. because, again, I'm not married to it, so... I don't know what people's mindsets are, and I don't think it's our place to really decide what their mindsets are. Everybody has a different reason why they want to collect. I mean, I don't know why you love The Miz so much, Zan, but that's just who you collect. I get it. So um, Unbelievable. <laughs> it's just... Um, Believe it or not, I almost, a side note, I almost did buy a Miz card today. What? Yep. Whoa, it really is a cold I was day looking, out. speaking of shiny, I was looking at a five-timers gold. Well, and that's something you could flip. I mean, yeah, if, exactly. if, and if you're into it because you want to invest, I mean, you're going to have two other kinds of people, people who are in it for a monetary side and people who are in it for a sheer nostalgia collectible side. Um, I know that when I go to Daryl's store, I, uh, you know, I always see him talking to customers all the time, talking like you, I want you to buy because you like it. I don't, I don't care about the money aspect of it. I want you to enjoy it. And he's always very good with his customers talking that way, saying, just buy what you like you know, and collect it for what you collect. You got one copy, keep your one copy. Do you need to have, you know, 15 of the same Jordan cards? Do you need to have 15 of the same Hogan cards? Not really, you don't, unless that's what you're doing. You're trying to plan for your future investments. Do you think that uh, inhibits the growth of that that segment? Okay, because that's what me and Drake are getting at because I know I'm going to, like, I've made a lot of cool relationships with this All-Stars quest that I'm on, but I'm also going, I I know what Drake is saying, and I'm going to run into that where I need certain cards, and if I don't talk to the right people, like, I'm just not going to Well, you're talking about a sector of the hobby, too, where we have the lowest print runs of any real major sport. I mean, so our our collectible, uh, our hobby is already limited to the amount of uh, stuff we can go out and get, even on a base set print run stuff. I mean, they're printing, you know, tens of thousands of, w, uh, you know, MBAs like that, but it was like, you know, comparatively, it's like maybe only a few thousand basically when it comes to, yeah. the, to wrestling, you know? So it's already a limited number of stuff out there as it is. So when people are kind of hoarding, you know, and, you know, in his case, uh, the red refractor, you know, red cards, like, I know two guys have got them I said, dude, just give me their address. I will fly out there. I'll beat their ass <laughs> for you. I'll get you your card right now. <laughs> oh, I love the it. rails. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Sheer, are, sheer brutality. That's right, man. I mean, uh, I don't know. You have anything to say about this one, Daryl? I agree with both of you guys. Uh, me personally, I collect for fun, not for profit. So if I, I me, I would rather have an older card that there's so few of that I've never seen before versus a whole stack of numbered cards. Okay. So I'd take my numbered cards, trade those off for something I don't have. Like I love Tony's 82 All-Stars. I don't have any of those in my collection. I would trade newer stuff to 
for something like that. The older stuff I got, I don't know what year that I think they're the 60s exhibit cards like Bobo Brazil, Hey Sex Calhoun. Mm -hmm. Those are you stuff got, I you like have, you have a few of them sitting in your store right now, I think. Yeah, I got almost a near set of them at the house. But I just like the older stuff. The newer stuff, just, to me, is too plentiful. And like you said, people collecting them, as long as there are people collecting them, the companies are going to keep making the product. So if they can sell 10 million of one card, guess what? They're going to make 20 million of it. It's also, an, I think, for also, it's an, it's an old guard mentality. We've, we've been talking a lot lately about, you know, some of the old guards, you know, these guys, the gatekeepers of this hobby. And some of them are, you know, they're just kind of set in their ways. It's just, I, I got to have them. It's a, maybe it was partially a collecting, you know, collecting at the time, but as the market has now changed over the years, they kind of like, hey, maybe if I start investing more Hogan 82s and more, you know, uh, Carnation sets and more of this kind of stuff, you know, these could have some high profitabilities. And, you know, God bless the guys out there, like the Pecs and the Englands out there, have been waving the, you know, the, the wrestling flag for us for all these years like that. I mean, they've, they've earned the right to, you know, kind of be where they're at in this hobby. Uh, but, you know, that's also kind of a little bit of an old guard mentality too, I think, where, you know, it'd be nice if you can let some of that stuff go because we have new collectors that would love to have some of that stuff in there and purely collect, not to try to invest. Well, yeah, you mentioned that one card, the Pegasus Kid. Yeah. That's a very early Crispin Wah card there that very few people even know about. I would trade all of my Miz rookie cards <laughs> for one of those because Miz is relatively new and he's got a ton of them out there where the Pegasus Kid... Good, bad, or ugly, he's got a history that people can relate to. They know of him. Yeah, so I get it. I gotta say this goes both ways too, because Drake already mentioned he, you know, there's a now again the card that he was looking for was only out of five, but there again there are people out there that are scooping trying to scoop up all five and then just hold them. And I think that's just as bad. Um, I guess I'm fortunate that I'm I'm kind of riding both sides of the fence here. Like uh, the vintage stuff is what I it's, it's not even the cards themselves. I love them. They tell a story, but it's the talent. You know, like a prime example, when everybody was going nuts about this CM Punk MJF dog collar match that's coming up, uh, I immediately went to, I was like, where's my Greg the Hammer Valentine cards? You know, where's my Roddy Piper stuff? Like I, I wanted to go back and look at that, you know, stuff from Starcade, and because that's what I connect with. But on the flip, on the flip side, like I love the shiny stuff. Like you can't beat a gold refractor. The black refractors look really nice. I mean, so Drake, we we know you know all about the super refractors, and so I mean, it's it everything is just awesome, and it's gonna go. You know, it could go too. It could go too far one way. Like you know, especially with the prism stuff coming out. Are we gonna see so many people talking about the same stuff that they're gonna say, okay, well, I'm gonna go look at some of these '86 carnations now, or go back even further? And to like the, you know, 1800s cards, I don't know, but I could just see it going too far one way or another. And I had the privilege that I'm a fan of like all of that kind of stuff. So I don't know. Yeah, I but, see, you're, I, but you're a little bit of a unique kind of uh, collector in that sense too. Cause I think that people who collect modern stuff only care about modern stuff. They don't care about the history of pro wrestling as a whole. And that could be uh, it, it is that I'm more of a historian correct. than, yeah. And so I, I really wish that, uh, and there's something that's in the works right now that we're going to be doing, like we're going to be taking certain cards and doing a history lesson. I'm taking Chef Carl's, you know, God rest his soul, taking his idea, his concept, we're going to kind of run with it. We're going to talk about a little bit about the history of wrestling using trading cards. I can't wait to see that then, because there definitely needs to be more people, like, appreciate, no, no, like so have to be like a fan of appreciating. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Drake, hopefully that uh, helped answer some of your question, but I know you've got another one, so go ahead with that. Yeah, for sure. So, like, if I can just just provide kind of a quick uh, wrap up, I guess, just kind of yeah. to, to some yeah. things you guys have said. You know, I think that it, it, it's one of those things where I think those guys they they waved the flag for so long, and you know, we're really behind the wrestling card growth and 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 that kind of stuff. And I think you know, at some point, they just have to realize, hey, you know, you can't just hoard everything. We've got to we've got to let some of that stuff go so that kind of grows the pool. And, you know, just really from a personal experience for me, I, I when I first got back into finding about wrestling cards, I gravitated to the 1982 Wrestling All-Star set. And one of my PC rules is I, if I have a slabbed card, I want the um, grade to be no lower than the decade that it was produced in, right? Cool. So my 82 All-Stars that I have are all a PSA 8. So the only one I'm missing that I really want in my collection is an PSA 8 Andre the Giant. 
So I immediately go to David Peck's page and I'm like, wow, this guy's got tons of PSA eights, mm-hmm. Andres. And I'm like, Hey, I'd love to get one of these from you. And he's like, no. Um, and it's nothing against David. I love David. We have great conversations. So um, I'm sure he'll listen to this. I hope he doesn't take, a piece <laughs> of that. but that's what, honestly, that's what drove me to look at the modern stuff because I, in other sports, I collect vintage and modern both and things like that. And, you know, we'll just take a Hulk Hogan and I went and looked and I'm like, wow, you know, Hulk Hogan has a, a tops chrome gold refractor from the 2015 set. And there's only 50 of those produced. And so you look at the all-stars and I, from a historical aspect, you know, that's, that's second to none, but at the end of the day, there were more than 50 of those that were produced. Mm -hmm. And so the value in that is driven by grade um, versus in this case, the value is driven by the artificial built-in scarcity by the numbering. So that's what drove me to that. And so my concern, I think, is that if, if those guys that are, you know, real heavy into vintage and kind of the, the old guard wave the flag and all that kind of stuff, you know, if that happened to me, how many other people is that going to happen to where they feel shut off from that side of the hobby that they just focus on this newer stuff? And I think that's why you're seeing a lot of this growth in the more modern stuff, even though the stars are not the Dusty Rhodes and the Von Erichs and the Ric Flairs and the Hulk Hogan's and Andre the Giants. People just, they feel like that's a more open community to uh, buy, sell, trade. All so do you thing. feel that's a good thing or a bad thing then? Well, I think it's a, it's a, it's a good thing for the growth of the hobby because, you know, the people who are spending money now that are coming in, that are getting that money um, and will continue to get that, you know, are kids that are in their teens now that. Oh, no. To spend. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So when, 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 when they get the money to spend, right, they're going to look back and say, wow, you know, I was a big fan of Roman Reigns when, you know, when I was a kid watching wrestling, they won't really know who Ric Flair was or the undertaker, or, you know, some of those guys way back when, um, because that's not who they watched every week on television day in and day yeah, out. Yeah, but that, you know? the flip side of that is, I don't, I don't know if I necessarily agree with that because I never saw Ty Cobb play. I never saw Babe Ruth play. But I know who these names are. It's like that. And I think there's going to be certain names like a Ric Flair and a Roman Reigns that, are, you know, obviously 30, 40 years from now, they're going to go, they're big names that even though I never saw them perform, I know who they are. And they're people that I still want to collect because they're legends. Yeah. But yeah, the old guys were more wrestling and the newer guys are more entertainment. Yep. So yeah, Hogan that. being very popular with no more than what, 30 minute match was one of the biggest in his career versus Ric Flair who went, 90 minutes more than once. Mm -hmm. So for us wrestling guys, we know Ric Flair, even though he wasn't on TV as much, based on what we read in newspapers and clippings, where Hogan was in our face for his entire career doing these squash matches. Because I think 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 guys like like a Hogan and Flair will always live forever in that sense, as far as from a collectability standpoint, obviously. They're they're Babe Ruth and Mickey Mantles of our of our of our hobby. It's like the, the comparison between Roman Reigns and somebody of equal talent. But because Reigns is pushed on us all day long. Yeah, but he's a hot commodity. I think I think 20, 30 years from now, he's going to be somebody. I mean, come on. We just had the Roman Reigns card sell for fifteen thousand dollars for crying out loud. I mean, I mean, clearly he is in the upper echelon when it comes to collectability right now in our in our hobby. Um, but do you think it's a, a, a spur of the moment thing where it just because he's popular no. right now, do you think he'll hold that value or do you think it's gonna come back down? No. I don't think it'll come down. I don't think it's gonna come down. No, not, not at all. Speaking uh, of coming down, though, let me let me say something to what Drake said and Tony, actually, because it just now popped in my head. And I feel like if I don't say it, I would be like it would th- this whole topic would not be justified. Um, Drake, you said people like yourself were turned off. I've actually talked to so many people and I won't name any names. It's all people we know on social media. that are like, I don't want anything to do with the all stars anymore because, number one, I see him too much. There's too many people talking about the same cards all the time. And that's all they talk about. Number two they don't let them go. And if they do let them go, they're outside of my price range when I can go buy, go buy a gold Roman Reigns refractor for a couple hundred dollars, as opposed to, you know, a thousand for, a, you know, a Dusty Rhodes. It's not that rare, but it's in a high grade or something like that. So I, I see, I see both sides and Tony's right too. Like people want to collect the legends, but the thing with vintage sports is that it seems like people are willing to move those even mickey mantle cards like Mm -hmm. if you go on ebay right now you can go 552 mantles people are willing to move those but a lot of these all-stars cards or even stuff further back from that you go to try to find them and they're just not there because people are just not willing to move them so sorry get that out there 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and and, and I think you know they, they want to collect the legends, but they're finding that there's modern cards of the legends, even if they're like post playing years, True. right? Yeah. So like a friend of mine that I'm that that uh, that I talked to, he's a big fan of of someone like Andre the Giant. He had no interest in his '82 All Stars card. He went straight to the 2014 set and bought his gold refractor. Um, he actually got it raw, got a PSA 10 on it. It's the only PSA 10 pop one route right now. And that interests him a heck of a lot more than the All-Stars card that, like you said, yep. you know, whether it's in the grade you want or whatever, you can go to eBay right now and type in 1982 under the giant All-Stars. And there's going to be at least one on there, right? Yep, there's a list. <laughs> right. So, yeah. And so I think the more modern collector, um, and as I think as we go in the future, that's going to that's gonna be what they look for. Is that something that like, I want something that nobody else has or very few people have. I mean, that's the way I think in my collecting mentality is I want stuff in my collection that nobody else has. It's not because I'm like, who I'm gonna cash in one day and this is that, that's just, it's more of like an individualist mentality and that you're, that's what makes your collection yours mm-hmm. versus right. saying, hey, I, you know, there's cards I have that everybody else has. That doesn't make you unique. And I think, you know, as people, we love to be around people and talk and all that, but everybody wants to have their own identity and personality uh, within their collection. Well, damn it. I'm going to take my 2000 uh, Divas cards so like that, that nobody else has. I'm getting them graded so I can go and flex the hell out of these things. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Drake, okay, go ahead with your next. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Tony, we'll make a deal. I'll, I'll trade you for your 82 All-Star Extras you got there because – Unlike these two on the bottom, I have never seen one of those except in your collection. So it's either eBay or your collection. Only time I've ever seen those. Nothing's ever walked Well, I don't, I don't have complete sets anymore. Uh, Zan took a couple cards from me. <laughs> and over the years, I, I sold my my Hogan, Flair, and Andre. So, but I have a... Uh, you guys have... talk like they're normal cards. Everybody's got them. I've been <laughs> running my shop for five years. I've been a collector for over, most of my life. And I have never seen them in person until I met Tony. Okay, well... I'll, I, I'll, I, I, do, I do have to say ever. that that once you get them in person, it's, it's a totally different thing. Like they, they are, I think they live up to the hype. I mean, like you see pictures of them, but then you get them in hand and you're like, man, like I'm holding a piece of history. Let's put it this way. I have seen more Michael Jordan PSA tens in my life than I have 82 all-stars. And that right there should tell you something about wrestling cards in general. Yeah, it should. Well, that's why I love them so much. Yep. Like I, said, I, I like to collect them and it's fun to get them. And I like the, all, the odd stuff. Yeah. yeah, and I've never seen the All Stars until Tony. Wow, well, person, talk about oddball stuff. Despite the fact that he is himself oddball, we have Zan over here likes to collect all the oddball stuff. I mean, he's an oddball. <laughs> yeah, I have all kinds of crazy stuff. Drake, we'll try this again. Go ahead. Right. Go ahead. Yep. yep. All right. So, um, you know, in your guys' opinion, what makes certain wrestlers collectible? Um, you know, the obvious ones are guys like Rock, Cena, Hulk Hogan. Um, you know, those folks that are you know, they're, they kind of transcend wrestling for what they've done, but then there's other wrestlers that, um, you know, also transcend the sport as well too. So you think about someone like the Miz, we know that, you know, Zan's a huge fan of and huge collector of, um, you know, he had, I love that it's sticking. I love that it's sticking. He had the like (laughs) reality TV stuff. He's been in movies, um, you know, that kind of stuff. Someone like a triple H, right. He's, he's been around forever. He's very successful WrestleMania main events. You know, now he's moved to the front office a guy like a Goldberg I mean the guy just never goes away I mean love him or hate him um it's amazing to see the shape that he's in at the age that he's at and you know but but he he is like herpes he won't go away no that's true that's true (laughs) you know and then uh and then someone like Sting right I mean Sting had multiple different personalities same thing he's still around he's still you know doing his thing and all that and so like so like why you know why are you know, they have that nostalgia factor too, but people just don't collect them like they want to gravitate to, to guys like The Rock and Cena and, you know, the bigger names. Um, so that's my question. Well, then you get to the point where you start out, you can even equate that into like, you know, why do not certain people don't get the love they deserve? Like, I've always been a proponent, like, why doesn't Mr. Perfect get the love he deserves in the hobby? Why doesn't Rick Rue get the love he deserves in this hobby? You know, uh, there's, we can go on and on like this. I mean, uh, granted, I recently now, I mean, before we talked about, I always said that, you know, Vince didn't get the love that he deserved in the hobbies like that, but then we have an almost $10,000 car to his sell. So maybe he's starting to get that love that he deserves, you know? <laughs> um, but yeah, it's all about, I mean, everybody has their own favorites. I mean, why does people like, uh, why does, why does Zan like love the Miz so much? I don't know why, <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's his thing. So if he wants to collect that, that's his thing. But 
Yeah, I think I, personally, Miz is one of the top seven or eight pl- wrestlers in WWE right now. Yeah, because he does I mean, it all. He wrestles. He talks. He can be good. He can be bad. He can carry on a good match just about anybody. And yeah. I mean, if that transcends to someone who you know wants to collect his cards, and that's why that, that's what they want to collect, and what makes them want to collect him, uh, is because they connect with that character. That character must mean something to them. That you know, whether it be in a wrestling ring or maybe I became a Sasha Banks fan because I love the Mandalorian so much. That's yeah. when I be, you know, maybe that's why I wanted to collect her. I don't know. I mean, I, I like Mr. Perfect just because I love the way he his whole character was done. I loved Rick Root because his character was done. I loved uh, Sensational Sherry because I just loved the way her character was done kind of thing. You know, those are things that I would collect if I was a diehard want to be those kind of people on my PC. It's like that. Kurt Angle. I love Kurt Angle. One, he's a friend. Two, I just think he's an amazing wrestler. So, I mean, I think it'd be awesome to collect him. So, uh that's why I connect with him. That's why I want to invest in in, in uh, his cards. Yeah, he has a lot to do with uh, the personality of the person they're going after. Like Charlotte is not very well liked. I don't care for her that much. Becky Lynch came from nothing to now she's got a personality. You can relate to that. So it doesn't matter how good a wrestler they are in terms of titles, in my opinion. I think oh, it's yeah. how yeah. they can react to the fan base, how they see themselves. Gonna, there's got to be a relatable essence to them. True. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's, it, 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 it does seem it goes far, far beyond accomplishments, you know, because oh, yeah. like you mentioned from a, someone like a Kurt Angle, I mean, you know, winning the gold medal with a broken freaking neck, um, you know, and then the, the, the multiple world championships that he's in, several promotions. I mean, uh, you know, seems like a great guy and he's very likable, and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. It, there's a lot of things that you would think like, wow, this guy is, is worth putting your money into. Let's go look at his cards. And you go look at his cars and you're going, gosh, this guy's so cheap for exactly everything that he's done. And it just blows me away. I mean, even if you don't have the accomplishments, but then you see someone like a Razor Ramon, you know, a Scott mm-hmm. Hall, who's never held the big, you know, the big world title, you know, in the big companies anyways. Um, and yet, you know, is loved by a lot of fans because of the whole NWO thing. So I have, but doesn't get any love in the collectible side of the world. I mean, there's not a whole, you can pluck him off for nothing. Yeah. Um, I, a couple things, I think like on the surface, everybody, it's a FOMO thing. And this almost goes back to the conversation we just had about shiny stuff and all stars, you know, people see what other people have and they want to go after it. And I think the rock and Hogan and, uh, Roman and Becky and Charlotte, like all of those names are prime targets for FOMO buys, whether, and, and this, most of the time, that's not a bad thing because I don't think any of their cards have ever gone down, but you know, that's a whole nother discussion. So I think it's just like sports cards. Everybody saw Zion, Luca, Trey, Mike Trout. Um, I mean, insert what Mahomes, I guess, whatever. You could take it any way you want. I think that happens with wrestling. But what I'm hoping that I think this Prism release is like I'm putting a lot of uh, eggs in this basket for the future of wrestling cards. And I say that because I'm hoping Prism is going to not only bring more people into wrestling cards, but I hope it's going to open people's eyes of ways of collecting. I want to see more uh, player collectors and super collectors. And, um, you know, they maybe I know team collecting is a thing in sports, but, it, you know, I don't know how you really do that in wrestling. But, you know, Drake, your way of collecting of not having a PSA slab in over the grade of the decade that it was, you know, that's an interesting way to collect. So I'm wondering if people start coming in and looking at how to collect differently with wrestling cards like people do now with 90s basketball where they go back and they're like okay well this is a super rare set i want the whole set we're already seeing that with wrestling cards with autographs or you know certain parallel stuff like that or you're seeing a lot of these people i really enjoy listening to content whether it's podcasts or videos where people are like player collecting and super collecting some obscure player from the nineties that, you know, gets no fanfare, but they're so passionate about it that it makes me want to do even more with the stuff that I collect. So my, my hope is that the collectability is going to expand now, whether that expands to um, obviously it will for dollars overall, but uh, I just, the more people we get involved to do different things like that, I think it will make more people collectible. It's just going to take some, I guess, broadening horizons a little bit. And maybe that does mean more sports card people coming into wrestling and saying, I used to love Bret Hart. I used to love Razor Ramon. And then all of a sudden they go down that rabbit hole. The next thing they know, they're buying 
87 tops and they're buying 95 action packed and, you know, just steamrolls from there. I think it's already happened though, in a sense, we've already had more eyeballs put on this hobby with the AEW release from upper deck. So a lot of guys who are AEW fans and that's all they really love it. They live and breathe AEW. They're finding out now. That's why the independent market is really expanding so much and so hot. People don't care that, Oh, this is MJF's first upper deck card, but he has other cards. He's had other cards before. Now they're clamoring for that kind of stuff. These people who are new to the hobby, who didn't know anything about it except for the upper deck product, are now going after Darby Allens and MJFs and things like that, looking for those old cards. Yep. It's happened. And and prison, as I say, the prison boys, they're all going to be coming into our, our hobby too. They're going to jump in this hobby and they're going to go in there and try to make flip, 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 because what they do. Uh, so we're going to have a lot more eyeballs in the product. And I think that flipping might, with the trickle down effect, might hit all of us who've been collecting other things over the years. We're going to see some value in our stuff kind of go up again, I think, with uh, these, you know, prison boys. And yeah, especially, and especially with the, the Chrome stuff. Like, Tony, we were talking about the, uh, it was the 06, 07 Chrome we were talking about. Like, that's a prime example of something that people are going to target because it's the first release of WWE Chrome. And, it, and if people know Prism, they're going to go straight to something else they know, which is Chrome. I mean, it's a prime parallel between sports cards when you're going from Prism to Chrome. And, you know, if you get priced out of the Prism stuff, just take a step back and look at the older stuff for the players or the team you like. So that's a good observation. All right. Next up, uh, Daryl, we'll go ahead and turn the show over to you to ask your question for the group. Well, if I remember correctly, I was asking about the autographs on a non-sports trading card versus a trade, a regular wrestling trading card. What do you guys think holds the most value? Would you rather have a rock on a wrestling card or the rock on one of his movie cards? <coughs> Interesting. I think I personally would stay with the wrestling myself because I'm a wrestling fan, but from what I've seen, some of the non-sports ones are worth more long-term value versus the wrestling ones. Yeah, if we're talking The Rock specifically, everything I've seen, the non-sports stuff is <coughs> it's higher value because it's a lot more rare. Like, they're just, I don't know where they are. I don't know if they were redemptions and they didn't get sent back. I don't know if they were... I can tell still... you that. I have an answer for that because you're talking about a big-time non-sport collector too. So Go ahead. They, all, all three of his releases were done by Inkworks. So those were all done by Inkworks stuff that he's only on three non-sport cards, Scorpion King, Mummy Returns, and Doom. Doom's the only one that he actually signed as Dwayne Johnson. The other two are signed as The Rock. The two Scorpion King ones, uh, Scorpion King and Mummy Returns, 100% for effect. I didn't collect Doom, so I have no idea. I don't remember if it being that or not. But those two from Mummy Returns and Scorpion King were done by Redemption. It literally would have like the Mummy Returns logo on it. On the back, it'd have a little box like that. And it'd have a check mark on it for which autograph card you were allowed to get and send it in for. Now, the problem with that is, and I don't give, I, again, I, I know we're a PG type of show, but I don't give an S <laughs> uh, about uh, the CEO from Inkworks was a little bit of a conniving kind of guy in that sense. He held back a lot of his high-end stuff. He held back the Tom Lee Jones Men in Black autographs. He held back a lot of Angelina Jolie autographs from Tomb Raider. He held back the rock autograph stuff and would go around to Comic-Con San Diego and he'd pass them off and trade them for other things, for things for his own collection. So as a collector, I had no chance of getting that kind of stuff. Like, well, sorry, we're sold out. Instead of getting, uh, you know, The Rock from Mummy Returns, we're sending you, uh, you know, uh, whatever his name is, who played uh, the Egyptian dude. That's, I mean, um, you know, it, he just had no chance. So <clears throat> there was not very many of them to begin with. So I don't have print run totals, but you're right. There are less of those than, say, the 98 superstars. Which there's not many of those to begin with either. So Correct. So, um, yeah. I, so yeah, I think it depends on the talent. So the rock as an example, like I, I would take any of them, but I, I think the non wrestling cards are probably going to be harder to find and more valuable long-term. Uh, I also think that might appeal to more mainstream person. It's like, Oh yeah, I saw that movie. I remember that guy in that movie as opposed to his wrestling picture, which maybe they didn't watch wrestling, but they know the rock now, obviously. Uh, I think there's, there's probably some other examples of like, maybe like JBL, like, do you have him, do you have him sign his football card or do you have him, you know, sign a, a rookie card of, of wrestling? Like what, you know, what is that? What about Brock Lesnar UFC versus WWE? I mean, there's a lot of people that are diehard Brock fans in the WWE that could care less about his UFC run. And vice but, versa. So, yeah. And vice versa. So 
Um, I think it's going to depend on the, the fan base that is specifically looking out that card because a WWE fan is going to pay more for, you know, a gold chrome WWE product than they would for like a, you know, select pick your parallel, whatever that is. So I think it just depends on the person that's actually seeking out the card because I could see both of them being right. God, I, now I so desperately want a Tooth Fairy autograph. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, for, for, for me, I would rather have the uh, wrestling card signed just because that's where I, you know, d d just like what, what's been said already. I mean, that's where I relate to the performer the most, right? So when, uh, when, when Dwayne Johnson's University of Miami card came out, and there's a lot of Dwayne Johnson rock cards I collect. And that, that wasn't one of them because I don't relate to him as a football player, just like with Brock Lesnar. Like, yeah, I know he's got the football cards and all that kind of stuff, but I don't relate to him as a football player. So um, for me, it's where I relate to that person the most. And for me, it would be in wrestling for someone like the rock as the example. I mean, would you like to have, like, I would have loved to have a triple H, you know, blade Trinity card. that have been kind of cool or, um, yeah. That would be nice. Andre the Giant and the Princess Bride. That would be a perfect example. Like that'd be an awesome card, right? Someone yep. should do an uh, Princess Bride like 30th anniversary or something like that, whatever it is, and have like an Andre cut signature card available. That'd be awesome. That would be cool. Yeah. The uh, the one regret I think I have is growing up in Memphis, right? And the Rock came, came through as Flex Cavana, and mm -hmm. I I I, uh, I I'm not gonna say I remember him signing, but I'm sure he signed Flex Cavana for somebody. Like how badass would that be to have a flex how can we haven't seen something around? like that in a while i mean yeah i'd love to does see that, something like that i mean does that go back to what we were talking about at the beginning of the show there are people out there that have them and they're just not giving them up they're just hoarding them yep or or they just got lost in the shuffle over the years like that and got rid of them because like oh yep. who's this guy yeah <laughs> yeah that's probably more it's, likely it's, it's like i was telling daryl the other night when we we're doing a test run uh make sure that we can connect here so I, I said i used to go to upw all the time that was a uh, as a training facility for wwe all the time mm -hmm. it, it was not unheard of to go see their monthly events the galaxy theater there in, in santa Ana, you know anaheim area and see you know jim ross up sitting up you know scouting people and then watching the prototype you know wrestle you know uh, tommy you know tank it's like that. And then I go afterwards and I've got somewhere in storage, I've got a sheet of papers, you know, from Cena signing the prototype sign. I got the nurse and so I mean, so all these old signatures, a lot of guys just threw them away. Like, ah, mm -hmm. just, eh, nobody you know, cares. It's just nurse who, who the hell is that? Which, you know? Once again, this keeps going back to this theme of how rare wrestling stuff is compared to everything else. Of course. All right. I want to jump in since we're talking about everything else. And, uh, Drake and Daryl, I think, will be able to relate with this more than Tony, but Tony's got enough experience that his information is going to be valuable as well, I have no doubt. What do you guys think I know is something... That's, that's not true. <laughs> what do you guys think is something that you've seen in whatever segment of sports cards you want to pick, whatever sport, it doesn't matter, something that has really taken off that has put that specific card, set, player, whatever it is, in the mainstream headlines, what do you think is something that wrestling card collectors could take from something like that and apply it to wrestling cards to maybe see that same kind of trajectory? I gotta think about that. No one wants to talk. No one wants to tackle this one. I thought man, I must ask too hard of a question. <laughs> I, well, I, I think for myself, I'd like to see more chances for memorabilia in okay. uh, things. I mean, Tops is starting to do, or the last batch was the, the, the ladder cuts for some of the cards. Mm -hmm. Those are cool. But I would like to see championship belts. You know, when they go out and they replace an old championship belt with a new one? Like a, a, like a piece of a ring-used belt? Yes. That's a good idea. That I think they make their own belts. They got everything fun with their logo and stuff on it. So I don't think it'd be that big a deal to, when they retire one, cut it up and put in some cards. I think long-term value and that would be great. I mean, can you imagine pulling a autograph belt piece of Undertaker or a dual autograph of Mick Foley and Undertaker for Hell in a Cell with a piece of the, and, the mat or something? And maybe big. just pulling that out of the WWE warehouse, like they've got the capability to do that. Yes. Then yeah. I then you got people like my wife who would say, like, why would you destroy something historical? I show her like a cut signature of like, you know, a uh, presidential thing, like, you know, when that what was it, Americana said that came out, it's like that, I, I pulled a William McKinley autograph card out of a cut signature of William McKinley, a president, okay, and I sold it for two grand, like right there, but then my wife would turn around and say like, 
why would someone cut that up and put it into a trading card? Why would you do that? Something like well, they've that. been cutting up baseball stuff for years. I mean, the Mickey Mantle bat, the Babe Ruth bat, the Josh Gibson bat, because they, they put them in thousands of products or thousands of pieces, and then everybody gets a piece of that history. Oh, it's, uh, the goes old, back to what we were talking about. Old fractional sharing. <laughs> yep. It goes back to the beginning where, you know, you, you could have one person that has the entire WrestleMania mat the entire mat is in their garage or that WWE can cut it up and give it to hundreds of people to experience that same thing. So I get it. Yeah. I I don't, I don't, I don't have, I really don't have an answer for your question, sir. Wow. Speechless. Tony is speechless. (laughs) I'm thinking about it. Let me, let me process. Sure. We got time. Drake's chomping at the bit. Spaghetti is settling. (laughs) I'm feeling good. (laughs) So, so, so full disclosure, since Zan and I have this card, you know, I think the Hulk Hogan precious metal gem card is one that Woo. I think uh, could get on a rocket ship. I mean, we've seen the PMGs and the regular sports, right. And kind of what they've done. Um, and then we've seen it. Recently. Yeah. The, the green Kobe, uh, yep. a little over 2 million. Two recently. million. Yep. Wait, didn't and we the, also just have the Spider-Man one too? One. Like, well, that's where right I was going. One, right? oh. Yeah. So you see the what it's done in Marvel. I mean, some of those I forget what it was. The the guy bought the Marvel Spider Man for like under a thousand dollars, and then he flipped it for what was it, fifty grand or something like that, yeah. mm-hmm. um, or, or, or possibly more than that. And so I think that's just something that PMGs are just so big, and they just have that such a historical place in the hobby. And so I think that's that's where you go and look is like not something that's really been like a flash in the pan, like a kaboom or something. I'm sure they're going to have the kabooms and the some kind of panini product that's coming out right and i don't know about the longevity of that they may be something that people look back on in 15 20 years but i think when you look at at pmgs and kind of their historical significance and other aspects of the hobby um i think that's one thing that that specific card it's too bad that that hulk hogan is the only wrestler that they had it'd be nice if they had more of a, a set of those but uh but yeah i think that's one thing to take a look at interesting yeah i think one one uh, trend that everybody's already on and I will, uh, Drake, you know, what's up with it. I was telling people to do it a long time ago, even though sometimes I wasn't taking that advice myself. Cause I was, I would end up buying other things here and there, but uh, Brett from stacking slabs also was on board and that is gold refractors, low numbered parallels that I saw that two years ago taken off in sports. And I'm like, okay, like why I see them in wrestling cards. Why are people not buying those? And, you know, why are, like, it still baffles me that you can go find, like, I guess this goes back to Drake's previous question, like, finding top autographs of, like, legends for five bucks. Same thing with these numbered parallels. I was like, why are people not buying these? It's taken off in sports. And, uh, you know, I was like, everybody should be buying these. And then here we are. Look today. We've got, finally, we've got top names and even, like, lower level talent. Like, you can, um, it's kind of reminded me of some of the 90s basketball stuff where some of the sets are so rare and so sought after that even your average player, you know, you could get 100, 200, 300 bucks for. And you're starting to see that with certain parallels of WWE talent, even some of them that aren't even with the company fetch 20, 30 bucks, which, you know, a couple of years ago, that was a $1 card if that. So I, I just think there are a lot of parallels, but uh, I'm with Drake on the PMGs. Just I'm like, I, even if it has a rocket ship, I'm not selling mine. Like that's going to be one of those that I hold for next to forever. But mm-hmm. there's there's some parallels there, whether it's the refractors or like Daryl said, um, what about RPAs? You know, that's a huge thing in sports. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, those are rookie patch autos. Mm-hmm. So Daryl's idea of having the piece of the championship belt will tie in perfect with that. Um, that's something that hasn't been done a lot with wrestling. I've seen a few of them that Tops has done with their Chrome set in the past, but um, maybe that just goes back to you can't really say what the rookie card is on some of these. We've seen how Tops handled that. Maybe Panini changes that, and they're able to identify rookie cards of rookie players, you know, that thing. The other thing is prospecting. Like, I don't know what we do with that because Prism's going to have, uh, you know, two two big talents I can think of right off is Braun Breaker and Nikita from both in NXT right now. I think those are going to be huge sought-after prospect cards, but does – Panini say, okay, these are the rookie cards. Do they not? Do they do RP? You know, it's going to be interesting. I see so much potential of crossover. I just don't know what that w- what it is yet. So it's going to take That's some a board. good idea. Go ahead. I like that. But how, if you're a WWE guy versus an AEW guy, so the first person to get a card in which 
organization is at their rookie card. Yeah. And that's, that's what I'm saying. Like upper deck already stated um, that they, you know, they weren't even going to go down that road because it's too hard to say, but maybe Panini puts more time into it to actually dissect if that person had a card prior to that. Maybe they don't, I don't know, but it's just something to think about. I think, you know, if they could actually distinguish efficient rookie card logos on their cards and do rookie patch autos, I think it would just take off with, because wrestling fans love memorabilia. They love autographs. And apparently they love rookie cards because a lot of people just go bananas over arguing about the That's stupid. All we wrestling. talk about is rookie it's so cards. So stupid. Man. Like, give me a PMG, give me a you know gold or fry, give me that stuff out of the rookie card any day of the week. So, I, 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 it's crazy. all right, Tony, it's your turn to get on your soapbox. I have no soapbox, man. We talked about everything already, man. Uh, I, I guess my question really is, since we're talking about other non-sport stuff, is I wanted to know. You know, I, I equate wrestling cards as non-sports. Oh. I just do. Always have. Uh, I always should always make to say, I would say that, you know, you never saw, you know, Griffey or McGuire going to the plate, cutting a promo, and then going ahead and taking a swing at the bats like that, you know. All that would have been kind of cool to see that. I'd watch baseball again if they yes. did that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so I've always kind of, it's, it's, it's a theatrical thing taking place inside of a ring. So I've always equated as non-sports. Um, I want to know people who collect wrestling, collect other non-sports. Do you? Uh, and when you do, are you collecting other non-sports? Are you collecting? Are you speculating other non-sports? Are you investing in other non-sport kind of cards? You know, uh, I've seen people now kind of getting more into like the rap kind of stuff. Guys who are normally known as like collecting, you know, uh, wrestling cards or how I came to know them as being wrestling card collectors are now kind of like, branching off into other non-sport stuff. Some guys are trying to, you know, shove some Rocky stuff down my throat. Some guys are trying to shove some, you know, uh, 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 you know, Snoop Dogg stuff down my throat. So I'm wondering if, uh, you know, can you learn something from wrestling cards that you can apply towards other non-sport cards? That's what I kind of want to know. I once again have a lot to say. Do you want me to start? <laughs> Go for it. First thing, don't spread yourself too thin. I'm a prime example of this. Uh, I've been down that rabbit hole, and if, Tony, you've you've pretty much seen everything I buy, sell, and trade from day one. I've been into this and that. And granted, there are avenues I've got into where I've stuck with it, and I'm still sticking with it today. But you know, I keep the farther I get away from wrestling cards, the the like more uneasy I feel about stuff, and I end up maybe just not caring about it. It boils down to what. Drake said earlier, and that's like connection. What do you connect with? So instead of um, going out and trying to collect, okay, you use the hip hop example. Sure. I'll go out and buy my King Diamond cards that I want. I'll just buy the one or the two and be done with it. Like, I don't feel like I have to have the whole set or anything like that. I'll buy a piece of something I connect with that I don't care as much about the monetary value per se. And I know it's not going to turn into this massive thing that's going to be a burden, whether that's a financial burden or a physical space burden. Exactly. That's it right there. A King Diamond, baby. <laughs> that's so cool. So I do that, though. Like, I went out. I was um, Christmas season last year. I was like, man, I love Christmas vacation so much. Boom. Found a Chevy Chase Tops throwback design with an autograph in a BGS slab. I was like, done. It's done. Very, very affordable. I need that one card. I've got the attachment. I could probably sell it and make some money down the road, but it's just that one piece. So I think, I think it's a fun thing that you can reach out and do, but I like to take that same approach with wrestling cards. I, I, I'm going after that 82 sign set. I'm going after the killer cross stuff. That's my super collection. And then I dabble with the, you know, super fractors or gold refractors or just the cool random odd pickups. And I think that's something that people could kind of take with the collecting habits and apply it to non-sport or sports. Like I buy more non-sport than I do sports. Like I just, it seems like every day that goes by with the exception of maybe an occasional pickup or a vintage piece, that's a whole nother thing, but I just lose interest in sports overall. Like we just mentioned baseball. Like I, I couldn't tell you the last time I really cared about baseball. I'll get some stuff. If I buy out a collection or do a trade with somebody, I'll get some stuff to resale, but all of that money is being put back into wrestling or being put back into non-sport. That's just how I've always been. So, and I seem to just be going more and more that direction. Yeah, non-sport for me has always been part of my life for a long time. I mean, when I was a younger kid, I collected a lot of sports, but in, you know, in the mid to late eighties, when I got into wrestling cards, uh, you know, that's kind of where it was at for me. And then I got into other things. So, I mean, I've had collections. I mean, hell, WTC, before it was WTC, 
it was called Com Collect. And Com Collect featured a nice four card spread where you can click on the cards and there was wrestling, Playboy, Buffy, and Star Wars. Four things I collected. <laughs> Those are the four things I collected. And that's what I was always into. And back then, of course, it was easy to get master sets if you wanted to back then, a lot easier than now, of course. But, but you know, I, I kind of applied all my things to each one. Like I have an attachment to this for whatever reason it is. So I went out and I collected it. And so I'm wondering if people kind of do that who are wrestling card collectors. Are they, I'm seeing more of it lately. So that's why I'm asking the question is, do you think that people who are trying to apply what they've learned from wrestling cards and applying it to non-sport? And if you do, what are you really applying? Is it because of that connection again? Is it because you're connected to that? Is it because it's an untapped market that you want to be in so you don't have any FOMO? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Both. Both. What about you, Drake? Yeah, so for me, I think uh, the only real, net, I guess, non-sport I collect outside of wrestling would be uh, Pokemon cards. Um, and what got me into that is my son was was into Pokemon. And I'm, I wouldn't call myself a hardcore collector. I, I have under 10, 10 Pokemon cards. And it was one of those things where he was asking me about it and there was all this modern new stuff. And I'm like, well, that doesn't really interest me. It's just kind of mass produced and that whole sort of thing. So then I went back and learned and I was like, okay, well that 1999 set was the first set produced in the U S or, you know, sold in the U S and okay, there's a first edition and there's a shadowless and all that. And so it's kind of, as, as our friend Brett McGrath says, you know, you got to turn left when everybody else is turning right. And so, as we saw in 2021, there was just a huge run up and a huge push, whether it was from the influencers or whatever, everybody was just all about the 1999 sets. Right. And, and I kind of thought about it. I'm like, well, you know, that's, that's all great and all. And those cards are pretty cool. And let's grab a couple of these for the collection. But is there a set that, hey, that came before that? Maybe let's go look at that. And that's when I learned about the 96 Japanese type sets. And so for me, that was kind of cool because I'm looking at, I'm like, okay, well, these people are spending, you know, 300 grand on a first edition Charizard PSA 10 where there's a hundred and something copies. Um, but, oh, by the way, the first Charizard that was ever printed on a card was from a 1996 card ass set that came out of a vending machine. And there's a red prism and there's a green prism and PSA combines them in the pop report. And there's something like 60, 60 something total PSA tens. And so I found that at a, a fraction of the cost of the 1999 first edition Charizard. And I'm like, well, this seems like a no brainer. And I think the market's kind of called up to that a little bit. So I think that's just, um, you know, just really to answer your question, Tony, I think that's, that's the, the one thing I think where you could apply that to on the other non-sport type stuff is that if everybody right now is talking about a Kim Kardashian card, that seems to be the flavor of the month, right? Sure. Like, look at somebody else. Like, don't say, oh gosh, I've got FOMO. I need to go buy a Kim Kardashian card right now. Like, don't do that. Or if, uh, you know, as we've talked about, if everybody's like, buy gold refractors, like gold is it and that sort of stuff. And then you get FOMO there. Don't go buy in the gold refractors. Go over there, as we've talked about, and find that, you know, the game worn stuff or the event worn stuff or the autograph stuff and things like that, because eventually attention will shift from one thing to the other. You just don't want to be buying where the attention is focused on right now. I always just believe just, just buy what you love that you're attached to for whatever way it may be. If you just, if you are a Kim Kardashian fan, then obviously go out and get it. I mean, but if you're not, yeah, I agree with you. Just don't buy it because everybody else is buying it. Now you feel like you need to, uh, if you're not a big fan, then don't like, I would never buy a Kim Kardashian car. I don't really care. I mean, I, I don't care if it sells for millions of dollars. I mean, it's just not my thing. So I kind of just tend to go where I, I, I'm a fan of. Yep, so like, exactly. like, like I'm, I'm over at Daryl's store the other day, you know, a few weeks back and he's got some of these, uh, Yo MTV raps cards in there. I go, I love those things, man. I used, I used to have a ton of those things back when they first came out. Like I love to have a box. And so I got a box from him. like that. And you know, now I'm kind of like, I like to have more boxes. I think they're kind of cool. I like to be able to make some sets out of it, possibly. Who knows? But because I'm attached to it. I love it. I remember it takes me to a place where I remember being and watching MTV when it actually had music. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just being attached to that kind of stuff. Like, I could probably easily find myself falling back into a, a Buffy the Vampire Slayer type of stuff. Because I, I watched the show. I was a fan of the show. I could find, I'd find myself falling into Marvel stuff I wanted to, not because of how popular it is now, but I've always been a Marvel fan, but I just never got into the card aspect of it. So it all depends on what you love and what you like. And then I think you also have to kind of gauge on what your wallet can afford too, even if you do love it.
Yeah. And then, and I think it also too, you also have to figure out, okay, like, is this someone I loved before or is this somebody that I love now because I have FOMO, you know, like Correct. With, yeah. with, 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 with the, re, with the recent that's a huge, huge thing right now that I, I see so many people chasing that. I'm sorry. I just had to get that out there. No, no, that's it's true. fine. I mean, it just seems like with the recent, you know, big sales, headlining sales with Roman Reigns. I mean, I can't tell you the number of messages I get every day from people who are like, we sell me your Roman Reigns cards. Like, do you know anybody that has Roman Reigns? Like everybody's looking for him right now. And the other day I got a message from a guy that was like, Hey, you know, I'm looking to get into wrestling cards. Can you direct me to a cool stone cold Steve Austin card? And I'm like, exactly. Like people aren't talking about stone cold Steve Austin right now. This guy had a nostalgic connected to him. Um, and so he's going after that. Um, and, you know, eventually people will look at, well, shoot, people are paying, you know, four or five figures for Roman Reigns cards. I see the Stone Cold Steve Austin card over here, and it's really cheap comparatively. One other thing to kind of book in this whole show, because we're about to wrap it up. Um, Drake said it about look using the Pokemon, and this is something that you can look at this with the All-Stars. You can look at this with non-sport. You can Everything we've talked about, you can wrap this up in. Prime example is the 82 Andre. Like that, that was the card. Everybody started looking at that. But over here on the left, when the market's going right, shout out Brett once again. Um, everybody was looking at those 73 annual cards, the hand cut, the like paper. Yep. And the, 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 the popularity was starting to gain there, but the dollar amount wasn't there. And now it's almost like you're starting to see those going for as much, if not more than the 82 All-Stars. And that's what you can see with non-sports. That's what you can see with wrestling. It doesn't matter. You just have to like put yourself out there to think a little bit different than what the mainstream thinks than what everybody's, you know, that if I want to talk about 82 all-stars all day long, it's not because I'm trying to be David Peck, Robbie. Like, I don't care. Like those guys have better collections than me and I don't, I don't ever plan to top them. It's because I have a connection with those cards. And if I, if I'm looking for, I was looking at Kerry Von Eric gold refractors today. I mean, that's, that's what I'm saying. That's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. Like, um, there's just so many different ways you can go about it. And I think people just need to like, you know, use our podcast, go listen to other content, use as many resources as you can to make educated decisions on what it is you connect with and what you think would be a good buy and something that would fit in your collection. Yeah. Never, ever, 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 ever think about buying based on financial gain. I think in this hobby, Always, always, always buy because you have some sort of a connection to that character, that promotion, that show, that movie, whatever it is. Let that guide you to where you want to go. Just because everybody else is now on the Roman Reigns, you know, uh, train, that's great. Are you a fan of Roman Reigns? No? Then don't be buying his stuff. Right. Just because you feel like you want to go out and, and, and you know, capitalize on that. If you're a fan of, you know, whoever – Buy that. That's what you makes you happy. Just do whatever it's going to make you happy on that. You know, it all goes back to what I've been saying to everybody in the shop and even to you, Tony. You collect for fun, not for profit. If you happen to make money later on down the road, great. But don't go into it thinking you're going to turn a great profit because when you don't, you're just going to be disappointed. When you're disappointed, you lose interest in what you're trying to do. Yeah, if we've already too many people. It's yeah, crazy. That's, what, that's what I was going to say. There's been not necessarily with wrestling, but I've seen sports card podcasts and YouTube channels that are no more. I've seen a lot of personalities that aren't out there anymore. It's because everything took a dip and that's all they were focused on. And it is a free country. You know, I think cards are a great way to make money and potentially make a living if you're working hard at it enough. But I don't think that's why any of us initially got into it. And that's probably why a lot of us that didn't initially get into it for that. That's why we're more successful because chances are, if anything, if, if there's something we liked, other people like it too. And I mean, it don't get me wrong. Me. Like I'm, I'm happy to flip stuff. Like, you know, everybody yeah. knows that I've had those 82 Cosmos cards just like that, uh, which I'll talk to you guys after the air, by the way. But I mean, I have no, I'm not married to those. And I found them in storage. I know they were part of my collection at one time. I bought them for, I'm telling you, like next to nothing, the whole set for, you know, 25, 30, 40 bucks, maybe tops for the whole thing. I had no intention, just sat in storage. I had no idea when I bought it in the early 2000s that that could be a, 10, 15, $20,000 card. I had no idea. Um, and I don't, but I'm not married to it. It's so like, Hey, I'm going to flip it, go and invest that money in something that I really am enjoying or am connect more connected to, whether it be a, a business and it be car related. I could take the card that I had that I have, I'm not married to flip it to turn that money into something that I'm actually more attached to. That's not even part of the hobby. Right. 
Well, and another thing is you just freed those cards up to go to somebody who is who willing want, to pay that much money. To have it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So now it's so, going to go, I'm hoping to a good home that someone's going to actually appreciate those. And it's something they've always been looking forward to because they're connected to that particular superstar. And now it's going to be in their collection. Everyone wins. Yep. All right, guys. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, Daryl, we'll start with you. Let everybody know about your shop and where they can find you or anything else you want to say before we get out of here. Well, I own 3D Sports Cards and Collectibles in Phoenix, Arizona. You can reach us there or you can find us online at 3dsportscards.net. We do a lot of variety of autographs, singles, sets, memorabilia, just about anything for the collector. And we're literally mom and pop. Just me and my wife opened a shop five years ago. I met Tony and he's brought me into a different era and we just keep going. Like I said, collect for fun, not for profit. You'll get a lot more fans. You get a lot more people coming to you and it spreads goodwill. Take care of the kids. They'll take care of the future. And guys listening to this, if you're, if you just heard a card shop owner tell you that that should tell you something about how to operate in the hobby. Just saying. Right. All right, Drake. We got to let you go. I know you've got a huge weekend ahead of you at the Dallas Card Show. You're going to go down there and uh, you're going to just beat up everybody on the wrestling cards and take all their money and take all their cards <laughs> for them. So let everybody know where if they you can won't, find you. I'll do it for you. <laughs> hey, it's time to lay the smack down in Dallas, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, so you can find me uh, pretty much on all social media, Facebook and Twitter, uh, Drake Magruder. And uh, on Instagram, I'm at Drake's underscore PC. So please feel, for, feel free to reach out. Please connect with me if you have any questions. Um, I'm very happy to help. Um, Dude's got a kick-ass collection of wrestling cards, man. I've been really super impressed with seeing the stuff you've been hitting lately. Uh, well, thank you very much. I'm, 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 I'm very proud of my collection. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to share it with everybody. And like I said, if, if you've got any questions, I'm always happy to help. Don't be afraid to ask questions of me or really of anybody in this group. So. Thank you guys for having us on. Thanks for coming on. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. We always love doing these roundtable episodes to get different perspectives because that's what it's all about. That's why me and Tony started doing content in the first place is to get the information out there and get perspective out there to make you think a little bit different when you're approaching the way you buy, sell, and trade your wrestling cards. Please subscribe whatever podcast platform you're listening to this on. Tell a friend about the show. Uh, tag us on any of us on social media. Uh, if you got questions, reach out to us, send us DMs. And yeah, thank you for watching. Support everybody on the show. We'll see you.